customers deserve to know what's being done to them at their institution. The fearful confessions of bank employees told a tale of putting sales above service, testing their conscience. I found myself waking up in the middle of the night and I can't get back to sleep. Pushing products that could lead to more debt, less wealth, and bad advice. She asked us to not disclose interest rates, um, to uh, hide interest rates, and to um, manipulate or lie about market conditions on investments. For those familiar with Canadian finance, it was no surprise. Yeah, I'm not surprised. Um, I've been following this uh, story for a long time. They don't really demonize the banks the way some people do. The, the banks are who they are. They're there to make money for their shareholders and provide a service. It's sort of like, okay, I don't trust the bank, but then what, what other options are there? And do I trust myself? Well, I know that I don't know math. Yes, won't you come in? Canadians' reliance on the friendly financial advisor goes back decades. Mr. Thompson, we're interested in helping anyone who's serious about investing. Oh, then I've come to the right place. I certainly have, sir. Cigarette? Oh, thank you. Previously, it was a service culture. They were a trusted advisor. They weren't primarily oriented towards making sales. Then you don't want me to place an order for some of these stocks today? No. You look this stuff over, and when you've decided on the type of stock that appeals to you, we can go about the formal opening of the account. Increasingly, big banks became financial supermarkets, taking over trust companies, brokerages, and mutual funds. Average Canadians are putting trust in a fund manager to play the stock market, make their money grow. And the role of financial advisors shifted. So perhaps in the 80s was when the banks started to think about implementing a sales and service culture. And that's when the essential conflict entered in that suddenly they were no longer simply interested in servicing and responding to consumers and became more interested in proactively selling. Now, one in three Canadian households has their money parked in mutual funds. More than $1.3 trillion. The big banks' financial advisors usually get commissions on those sales and charge Canadians what analysts say are the highest fees in the developed world. Basically what that means is that tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars in your future returns, depending on how long you've been investing for, are going up in smoke. And I think there's some real incentive issues that need to be addressed when it comes to recommending mutual funds in this country. And I think that's the strongest argument in favor of robo-advisors. So-called robo-advisors are on the rise, part of a burgeoning financial tech sector offering customized portfolios, served up in seconds by high-performance algorithms at a fraction of the price. Industry leaders like Randy Cass take pains to point out you still talk to human beings. There is a misconception that exists that robo-advisors or, or digital advisors like Nest Wealth uh, mean that you don't have human interaction. And that's not true in Canada. Customers talk to advisors by phone who have no pressure to sell costly mutual funds. Those funds are often active, relying on legions of researchers and stock pickers. Robos use passive products like exchange-traded funds and index funds that track rather than try to beat the market. Turns out that strategy works extremely well. The active managers would claim that they can actually outperform the market in the long run. The reality is there are no funds that outperform the market in the long run. The studies all demonstrate outperforming a passive portfolio of low-cost ETFs over a long period of time, almost impossible. The fact that you will lose wealth trying to do that is as certain as death and taxes in this country. Right now, robos manage a tiny fraction of Canadian investment cash. But analysts project they could eventually cut deep into the bank's wealth management profits. And business is booming. Every month for us is a record month over the previous month. There is no limitation to the growth of this part of the industry except for the people's awareness of that this actually exists. But Canada's big five have deep pockets and rarely miss an opportunity. If you talk to the robos, they'll say, uh, they'll come off like they're straight out of Silicon Valley and they'll say, we're disrupting this industry, it's ripe, it's ripe for disruption. <clears throat> I'm not really getting all that excited about uh, sort of these guys represent a major threat because you look at it, the banks 
are so quick to react. Like online banking used to be a major threat. You are borrowing money in many ways. You might remember online banking upstarts like ING Direct. And save your money. ING Bank from the Netherlands is planning to sweep into Canada and rattle the pillars of our banking community. They're doing it using new technology, arriving electronically. Scotia bought ING in 2012. Now it's called Tangerine. For the big five, online banking wasn't a threat. It was the promise of profit. And last year, BMO launched its own robo-advisor service. The big five banks are all keeping an eye on this. When the marketplace acceptance reaches the point that there's a significant enough segment, the big banks will launch their own offer in that area, and they'll do it very well. So far, Canadian robos like Cass want to beat the banks, not become them. The opportunities exist for us to get taken out. The opportunities exist and have already occurred for big five banks to knock on the door and ask if we're interested in a check. We're not right now. But if Canadians want more options than whatever the big five offer, they'll need to invest in them and hold their breath.